Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast live. I need to slide over a little bit. <laughs> live podcast show on YouTube. How's everybody doing, man? I hope you guys are doing great. Uh, all right, a good week. I have some uh, cool stuff to share with you guys, some exciting stuff to share, uh, some good questions, some already some great comments and, and some uh, early riser questions, some ones sent throughout the week, and of course, uh, in real time. If you're new uh, to hanging out live, please put the question marks at the beginning of the question or comment or subject that you want to discuss. That way I can see it. Um, if you see people with a blue name and a blue wrench, they're the moderators. They have a way to send me a private message as well in case I'm missing something that's super important or maybe interesting. Um, I guess it's all super important. It's just extra inter interesting. And of course, I just want to thank the patrons and the channel members. You can see them na their names in green that are the sponsors of the 333 uh, podcast episodes, which is pretty impressive uh, that we've gone so long uh, with fan funding. Uh, and it's really cool, especially now. You know, in the beginning, it was always nice to say that it was fan funded because it was like, I can't believe, you know, you have this energy from this community funding the channel uh, and funding this, this show, I should say. And and uh, now it's just just surreal because it's not only cool, but I mean, you know, there are some companies that would like to take it over. <laughs> and I'm glad that they don't have a chance. I'm glad that we're, we're keeping it to us. This is our community. Let's just keep it this way. Okay, so... Um, Let's see. So Fast Freddy said, new room or new angle? Uh, neither. Maybe new lighting? Uh, so <laughs> there is new lighting, though. Maybe that's what changes it. Always changes it up. Um, so uh, what are we going to do? What, what should I start with? Should I start with the topics of the week or the uh, questions from the week and topics? Or should I do the early risers? Let's, uh, let's start with some easy ones. First, a question I saw from early riser was Stephen Wright, who said, uh, Phil, what is the difference between the Godo 510 bridge, which is a very popular bridge used by Sir, Ibanez, Kiesel, you name it, and the Kiesel hip shop trim? Uh, so the bigger question I don't know the answer to is what's different between the Kiesel hip shot tremolo and a regular hip shot tremolo? I don't know, but I will definitely find out for you. But the question I can't answer is the question you actually asked, which is the difference between the hip shot trim, Kiesel, and the Godo. So like if you're looking at the Kiesel, that's two choices. I have guitars, as you can see right here. Here's the Kiesel with the uh, hip shot, uh, Kiesel hip shot trim. And of course I do have Kiesels with the Godo 510, and of course tons of other guitars. Um, it's super easy. Uh, it sounds going to sound strange because <laughs> the way I got to phrase it, but I hope it'll make sense when you get to the end of, end, end of my sentence. Um, I like the hip shot tremolo more. Okay. The key, the keys will hip shot tremolo more or just the hip shot tremolo more. I, again, I don't know what's different about there specifically, but I like that tremolo more. However, when I say more, I mean, it's just preference is something I like it overall. It just feels really nice and spongy on the tremolo arm, uh, kind of like a Floyd Rose, just kind of nice, not as spongy. I'm just the word I'm going to use <laughs> as a Bigsby where it just floats all over the place. Um, but if you guys notice, like a lot of guitars, I use the key, uh, the, uh, the Godo 510 the most. In fact, most of my guitars have the Godo 510. The Godo 510 to me is more like a, a Fender two-point tremolo system. I like it more than Fender's two-point tremolo system. Uh, it's my favorite two-point tremolo system like that. Um, in other words, like a Fender style one. Uh, it's it's good. And sometimes you want that. You know, just like a Floyd Rose. Sometimes I want that. Sometimes I want a Bigsby. Sometimes I want the feel of a certain type of bridge. To me, if I want a Fender style trim, I use a Godo 510. To me, it's just it's just the 510. It's just a, the Fender style trim I like the most. The hip shot trim, even, weirdly enough, the Kiesel, like I said, I prefer it or prefer it more overall. Like I said, we're just talking tremolos. We're not trying to recreate the feel of a type of guitar. I just like that tremolo. I like that tremolo because, believe it or not, it also vibes to me very much like the Vega trim. Um, and if you guys, a lot of you guys know, if you have the Vega trim, same thing. It's just really kind of nice. I feel like you don't have to work so hard. <laughs> you just kind of touch it and it just does its thing and it flutters or it just it's lightly, it lightly moves. And, and if I was going to, you know, like create a guitar that was like, oh, I just want that kind of perfect tremolo, I would go with the hip shot or the Vega trim uh, for me personally. But the 510 is definitely if I'm like, I want a traditional feel because and why would you want that? <laughs> Is a crazy question uh, or qu crazy thing to think about. But here's why. Look, I have a vintage style reissued Strat up on the wall right there. 
there's something about that feel. I wouldn't want to modernize that Strat. It wouldn't feel the same. So to me, the same thing with 510. I want that feel. A little bit stiff. Not bad, though. It's not, and it's, These are not negative things. Just a little bit more stiff. You know, just not the same. Uh, and um, there you go. That's my, my take on it. Um, and actually, you know, to be honest, <laughs> not to be honest, I guess I'm being honest, but I'm saying to, to, to dive even deeper, you know what tremolo I probably like even a little bit more than the hip shot or the Kiesel hip shot and the Vega trim is the Nags tremolo. <laughs> the only thing I'm appreh apprehensive about that is, I mean, talk about a tremolo, you can only get one way. It comes on that guitar, that super expensive guitar right there. If you buy one of those super expensive Nags guitars, and if you guys know, if you ever watched the interview I did with Joe Nags and Peter Wolf, the owners of Nags Guitars, you know they're never going to do an affordable import um, because of his, uh, I would say, uh, controversial statements on the podcast. He said some controversial stuff. When I say controversial, I mean, I thought I, I agree with him. I just, you know, yeah, it was a controversial stance. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should probably check out that interview. It was a great interview. It's one of my favorites. Uh, up there with Ola Strandberg's interview, and it's on my second channel. You can check that out if you're curious. Or maybe somebody will leak it to you here in the comments, and I'm, I'm okay with that too. Okay. Um, uh, Mike Guard. Okay, so this is great. I love segues into other questions. So Mike Guard's got a question right now, and I got a question during the week, and I think they kind of tie in, and it's great. So I'm going to go with Mike Guard's question first, since he's here live. Mike Guard said, Phil, Will you be keeping or buying any of the newly released SE models and why? So if you watched, I hope you did watch because it was one of my favorite videos I ever did, uh, you know, which is new. I, you know, I'd like to say every new video I do is my favorite, but no. Um, this one was a lot of fun because I, I actually got to do like unbox the three new Paul Reed Smith SE models. Um, PRS was really cool. They reached out to me like a while back. It felt like months ago, but I don't remember when and said, hey, we have some new SEs coming in fourth quarter. We'd like you to check one out. And I responded to them with, I'd like to check them all out. <laughs> I said, I got a new studio in a way that where it's just a little bit easier for me for the flow. You know, I'm not dropping boxes at my feet and then, you know, kind of recutting, you know, cutting to the next box and stuff. And uh, so I did a video of all three, the three new models that they came out, right? Which was the solid, uh, the uh, solid, sorry, Swamp Ash Special, uh, the uh, CE, SECE, uh, 24 and of course the custom 24 quilt uh, which is right there in that amazing violet finish that you're probably seeing all over the internet i'm sure they did a lot of promotion with these um but what's interesting was i said hey look i'd like you to send me these three guitars and this is what i'd like to do i'd like to give one away you know and so um interestingly enough you guys have me in a um you have me in a quandary <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to say it this way. Uh, um, so if you want to enter, let's start with what you can do. You, if you want to enter to win the PRS uh, Swamp Ash Special guitar, um, you can click the link. I put it in this video. It's in this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, PRS SE video. Uh, so click it, you know, click it, enter your email address, and if you win, I'll contact you. You can win that guitar. It's pretty cool. Um, so the question was, will I be keeping any or... Or buying any? Uh, well, um, I don't want. To, I I cannot say. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm just like I said. This is why you're having a quandary. So we did a special promotion. I thought it would be fun, and so that's why I cannot say. And I'm gonna tell you why. Um, we're giving away one. We're giving the Swamp Ash Special. My logic was that was the most exciting of the three in the new release, right? I thought the CE was cool, but they had a CE. The Swamp Ash Special was kind of different. So that's why I picked that one. Plus, it was the mid-tier price one, and I thought that kind of made sense. So let's give that one away. Um, and, and just to be clear, so you understand, just like all, a lot of these pro, uh, pro programs, so you understand, um, PRS was kind enough to give us the guitars but and let us give one away. But we're paying the shipping and stuff, right? So, so I'm just being very clear about that. Um, but with the patron and the channel members, they um, they sometimes receive extra 
benefits. So the benefits, so you know, are like when we give, do a giveaway, I'll just tell you because it already happened. First, let me just do this out of order. Um, let's make an announcement because it's here and I can see it. Um, so as you guys know, we were giving away the Stratasonic. Seth Dunphy just won. He was the winner. He won and he was notified uh, and he won. And so he's already emailed me his address and it's already been shipped. Uh, the missus got it out and shipped it out. And we threw in a, a snark, which we'll talk about the snark winners in a minute. And we threw in, you know, our threw in the swag and all that stuff and we shipped it out. Um, so in that contest for the win, the Stratasonic, just so you guys know, and I don't want you to think this is anything because I don't always do this. Okay. So it's no guarantee. But in the Stratasonic, what I do a lot of times on the giveaways when somebody wins is I throw in something extra or do something a little extra that I didn't expect. I, we're really common to do that, but don't ever expect that right? It just happens. The other thing that happens is the patrons and the channel members, because they support the channel, um, I tell them privately that if they win it, if they're one of the ones that win it, I'll do this extra thing for it, right? Or I'll throw in something extra, you know, since I have it and I know them, right? It's just an easy thing to do. So so sometimes it happened. Unfortunately, uh, Seth Dunphy wasn't, you know, he's not, it he wasn't a premium member thing. So I didn't do the extra thing. And that kind of works out for me too. So the reason I'm telling you that is on the, on the SE deal, um, if you win the SE, you're going to win the, um, Swamp Ash special. But if you're a patron, a member, you get to pick, you get to pick the one of the three. That's why I don't want to tell you which one I like the most, because that might influence what one they pick. Not because I'm afraid they're going to pick the one I like the most. I just don't want to influence which one they want to pick. So they get a little extra, a little something if they want to pick one of the different ones. I don't, I don't know if they'll pick anything other than the Swamp Ash special. So there, there you go. On the, on the core, on the core of it, on the kind of like the whole of that video. Um, you know, I really, I'm partial. As I said in the video, I love the CE. I'm a CE fan. There's my CE right there. That's my core CE. I love it. And I love that guitar. I, uh, I, I like the Swamp Ash Special a lot. And I have to say that custom 24 color is just beyond crazy. Like the depth of it. To me, it looks like crazy clouds, like purplish pink clouds. Looks really cool. Um, I, I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you just cause this never happens. Uh, uh, the, the missus, she put that there. <laughs> she put, I saw, she's like, Hey, I'm going to put that guitar there. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and cause she thought it looked cool and then she looked cool, cool behind me. So I did that and I, I thought that was cool. So, um, so that's my answer to that is I know it's kind of vague, but you know, uh, so will I be getting any, I don't know. See, the problem with SEs for me is I love SEs. I love them a lot, but a lot of times I have the core version of them cause I have a ton of guitars. So that I just don't know the answer to. I don't know if I would be uh, doing that, uh, buying one. But there's something that else ties into this that's probably worth talking about. During the week, I got an email from Gigmeister, like the amp. Uh, it says, plow, uh, plow, plowing, plowing with the P. No, PRS is blowing out guitars. What does this mean? This ties in, uh, so you know. Okay, so I want to tie in a couple things. Um, and um, here's uh, to your question about, you know, which SE would I buy? What, and do I like the SEs? Uh, yes, I absolutely love the SEs. If you guys have noticed, uh, or maybe you haven't, I'm going to let you know now that PRS is effectively blowing out the PRS SEs. So I'm going to show you this and then I'm going to explain why and, uh, and we'll talk about that and why it's important. Okay. So let me go ahead and show you this. So first of all, it's right on their website. You can see PRS SE holiday sale, 20% off. This is legitimate off all SEs excludes the PRS SE GGT. That's the only one that's excluded. This is US and Canada. Please don't kill the messenger if you're in Europe and stuff. I, I didn't control this. Um, this is only from October 12th, which was yesterday to October 31st. This is Every dealer, as far as I know, and if it's not every dealer, trust me, you'll find a dealer that will honor this 20% off. Um, you, If you don't know, you can go to PRS website, go exactly where I did that banner. Let's go to here. You click on the banner. It's going to take you right here to find a PRS dealer. Here you go, right? And you just find the dealer you want. And there you go. Make your purchases. Um, I, as far as I know, and I could be slightly incorrect, but I don't think I am, this isn't excluded 
uh, from like out of stock in stock stuff, like, right. I mean, it's just as long as you purchase it in this time frame. So for instance, I've already seen where Sweetwater and I put a link to Sweetwater and reverb, because if you click those links, not only can you save 20% off, but you know, they kick a little back to the channel, you know, if you, if you use the links, however, uh, Sweetwater, what I noticed right away was interesting was if it was out of stock, they were still doing the deal. And so was some other dealers I saw doing that too. So 20% off. Um, now if you're paying attention, uh, that's like, that's like the beginning of the inflation. That's basically where the PRSs were in some cases, actually less than where they were when, you know, COVID started. So this is a legitimate sale, 20%. As I've told you before, uh, most dealers are going to experience a 30 to 40% margin if they're lucky, depending on what they're buying and what product they're buying. And, um, and so you understand this is a pretty, this is half their margin. They're giving away 50% of their margin away essentially or more. And, and why I say that is because it depends with PRS, as you know, with PRS, it depends on, you know, what your buy-in level is, how many guitars you're buying, just like any other dealer that are manufacturer, right? So it's a substantial discount. Now, here is the interesting part. The, the core of that question was, uh, did you see, did I see that they were blowing out the guitars, but what does it mean? And here's what it means. It means I personally think this is my opinion. I think it means more than most people think it means. <laughs> okay. Here's what it means. First of all, let's just start with what I pretty much know. They're, they're right sizing their inventory is the right way to say that. Okay. It's not, obviously we talked about it in July. If you guys remember in July, it's time stamped on the episode, uh, of the podcast where I talked about the fact that there was a massive amount of Paul Reed Smith SEs, uh, in the market. Like every music store I went to, I said, just so many Paul Reed Smith SEs currently right now under brand new, just the turn, you know, the, the, the search brand new on reverb, there's 5,000 plus SEs, not used ones, just new ones available from dealers on reverb, 5,000. Probably doesn't sound like a lot. That is a lot. Okay. Because that's a lot of guitars to sell. Okay. So they are overstocked. That's why they need, they need to right size, right size their inventory. That is exactly why they're doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm not saying that they told me exactly this, but I'm just saying we know the answer. They have a lot of inventory and they've decided, you know, what's going to make it work. They probably sat in a meeting and figured out what's the discount. And they probably figured out 10% would move some 30% would be probably too brutal on themselves. Cause that's huge. Right. And 20% is the right discount to go. Now here's the important part. This is not, this is much different. And this is, like I said, I told you guys, I was going to separate from the, what it, what we know and what this really means. That's important. This really shows how I felt. I kind of, I got to tell you, I felt a little guilty as I've been talking on this show as you know, I, I consider myself a decent person and a nice person. And sometimes I critique just like anybody, you know, right. Whether I'm making videos or on this show. And when I critique a person or a company, you know, like anyone, I actually honestly feel bad. I don't want to critique people. Um, I don't feel like I'm harsh, but sometimes I critique a company or, or say something. And then later I, I regret it. And, uh, even if I was correct or right or whatever. And as you know, I really came down hard on the fender folks and how they basically decided to basically compete against their dealership and discount their products. Um, cause again, they were trying to right size their inventory too. They were always stocked. This thing that PRS just did is exactly why I guess I was so concerned and disturbed by how Fender did it. This is the right way to do it. They're doing it through their dealer network. They're supporting their dealer network. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to know, um, I talked to PRS, not Paul, but you know, PRS, the company, and they were willing to give me the, you know, what they're doing to help dealers or what they're going to do. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to know. It's not my business and it's none of your guys' business either. All you have to know is that you can buy a PRS SE right now, excluding the, the DGT for 20% off, which is a huge savings, right? It's tax plus 10% in most cases, right? You know, and you know why they're doing it. They got a lot of guitars. They want to thin down because, you know, like I said, inventory rich, right? They're just sitting on a lot of inventory and we know why they're inventory rich. We know why they're all inventory rich. They all basically the ships showed up. Literally the ships showed up 
as the guitar boom slowed back down, right? And then these all they all got was in their inventory that they would have loved to have six months to a year earlier. So the important part of this is the way they're doing this just shows that there's different ways to do to do the same thing, right? Um, again, I don't want to villainize anybody. That's not what this is about. I'm just again, we're just critiquing as guitar as a guitar community. You could go against your dealer network. You can, in other words, tell your dealers they got to buy all this product, and then of course now discount your product against them, and you know, and sell it straight to your consumer to the consumer base and bypass the dealers, like Fender kind of did or did actually. Or you could do it the way PRS just did. And anyway, I think it was a smart move, and I think it makes sense. Um, so, you know, it it just, I thought this was cool. And I wanted to share it because of all those reasons. I think it's a le legitimate discount. I think the way it was executed was ethically um, better, right? I'm not going to say it's the best. I don't know. I don't know all the ethics, okay? I don't know everything that happened. Um, but I know that the way this is done is better. I mean, look at what I just did. I went to Paul Reed Smith's website and here it is. Let's go back. Let's back back out again. And it's like, find a dealer, get a deal on a guitar and find a deal. Right. Um, and there you go. Now, when we talked about Fender blowing out product a, a couple weeks, a couple months ago, it was, you go to Fender's website and they were going to sell it to you directly. And then the dealers were going to have to figure out what to do with their stuff. And so like I said, I just thought it was interesting. And again, more proof, because sometimes one of the only pushbacks uh, I saw from the Fender thing, and rightly so, was, hey, Phil, you know, they had a lot of inventory. What'd you expect them to do? Better. And this this is proof that you can do better. You can do better. It's, I didn't, I'm not trying to say that, you know, again, I'm not villainizing, saying there is, there is an opportunity to do better, right? You could figure out a better way. Um, and, and I don't know if it was done on purpose or not. But if it was done on purpose, congratulations to the PRS people for releasing some new product and then doing the, this deal. Because think about this, they just got the excitement, they got us all going. And think of how crazy this is. Um, one of my viewers sent me a message, uh, and actually, so, <laughs> so you know, it's Brian Stewart, he's a moderator. Uh, he bought a Paul Reed Smith CE, S-E-C-E 24, and he got the 20% off. And how cool is that? I mean, in my video, it's like, ah, guitar 699. He's like, nah, it's actually 549 way better. So like I said, there you go. That's my two cents on that. Um, and if you guys think it's just because I'm a PRS fanboy, then go ahead and hit me how you want to hit me. But uh, again, like I said, I own more Fenders than PRSs. I own more Gibsons than PRSs. I like all three of those brands. And I try to say, uh, I, again, I'm not trying to say my opinion is right. I'm just trying to try to say, I, I say what I feel. That's how I feel about these circumstances. Um, the, um, yeah, and then some people were saying, like, you know, uh, or you can overprice everything like Gibson. Again, like, everybody raised their prices, too. So let's, again, like I said, that's why I said, this is a discount for PRS, but let's be honest. They just, they had to rise pr raise prices, too. So it's like, uh, it feels good, but it'd feel a lot better if it was a discount off the old prices. But those days are gone. Um, Okay, hold on a second. Uh... Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> Ones and zero says 20% off is only 80% off away. Sorry, 80% away from free. Nice, nice. That's a great comment. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, El Dudorino says, Phil, you aren't a PRS fanboy. You're a Kiesel fanboy. I, you know what? I'll take any, I'll take all the fanboy things. You, you can't hurt my feelings. I, I know you do to read You don't mean to. Or you're not trying to make hurt my feelings. That's what I'm not saying. I'm saying that, uh, one, you're funny. That's funny. But two, everybody, <laughs> right? Say them all. I'm a Framus fanboy. I'm a, uh, I'm a, Dan, a Dan Electro fanboy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fanboy. That's a, like I've said. I, one of my things that I, first time I ever said anything that, um, I felt like I was stepping outside of myself on this podcast. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever had an experience like I've I've had uh, I've gotten to have because of this, where you're in the public's eye, you know, and you say things that are personal sometimes, or you say some things that's uh, emotional, 
and you're like, I'm telling the world this. <laughs> and a lot of people are like, yeah, I've done it too. And I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden like a hundred thousand views or a quarter, you know, quarter million views of me saying this weird thing. And uh, one of the things I said was the first thing I ever said when I was like, oh, I can't believe I said that loud was I said, I'm dumb and I buy stuff because I'm a fanboy. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. I My emotions definitely overtake me more so than the logic every time. So, all right. That's my, uh, that's it. That's all I got on that subject. Any, uh, I'd love any feedback. We can come back to it too. Like I said, um, it was really cool to see them execute this way. I thought it was a great plan. So, you know, and, um, and of course, you know what? I think we're going to see more of this from more companies. Of course, companies have to, like I said, right size their inventory. You can't have a boom for almost two years, load up all this inventory, watch the market slow down a little bit and go, I guess we're just going to have warehouses full of this stuff. It doesn't make any sense, not only from a tax purpose, for a business purpose, for anything. You got to you gotta thin the herd. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So it's cool. But I was really, uh, I was going to tell you, another thing I was impressed with was, um, I don't know if they had an actual meeting about this particular part, but I would think they would have to. Um, I, my guess, I don't know. My guess is the DGT is excluded, and I could totally be wrong because it's so popular. I feel like out of all the guitars I've read from PRSSEs over the last couple of years, they keep getting better. Like the, the, the hollow body SEs were freaking amazing. The Silver Sky off the charts, amazing. The, um, the Paul's guitar, amazing, but not talking to quality, just talking about the pow factor of it. I feel like I haven't had a video or seen videos go as big and as bold, you know, as the DGT. In other words, like just because sometimes you guys just see views and you go, Oh, he's got a hundred thousand views on this. And he's got 50,000 views on this and 30,000 views of this and 300,000 views on this. And then to you, you might calculate success that way. I, like I said, I calculate the success of the video of how long you stay engaged in that video and the DGT. I don't know what the views are. I don't really care. I just know that people like hung on like almost the whole video. So that tells me they were really interested in that subject. So maybe it's just a huge seller for them and they don't have any to discount. So that's what they're doing. But what I was going to say, what I thought was going to be the hard part for them was I thought for sure they were going to say 20% off all PRSSEs, excluding the three new ones we just came out with, but they threw those in too, which is shocking. So there you go. All right. Hawkhead said, I'm a snark fanboy. Let's segue to that real quick. Um, just cause I want to do the thing. Thank yous for this. Um, we had five winners last week. I, uh, well, I didn't pick them. The randomizer at King Sumo picks them and, uh, four have emailed me back. So by the way, if you have an email from me that says, Hey, it's Phil. And you have, and you ha I have two snarks for you. That was from me. So please check your emails. Um, Charles Douglas, Sean and Kevin, Congratulations. They all won two snarks each. That was nice to do the giveaway on that. It was a lot of fun. Um, way more than you uh, I signed up for it than I thought you were. Um, are we going to do giveaways today with snarks? We're not. Um, That's the first thing my wife asked me. It's because on Monday, she's got to ship out these snarks. And then the PRS giveaway is this week coming up. And we're going to have to ship that out. And so I told her, I go, well, next Friday, we'll, we'll do some more. Okay. So like I said, uh, I appreciate you guys first entering and doing all the stuff and being part of the community, but also understanding like I got to parcel this out at a pace. It's a, you know, <laughs> I like, I like to do stuff with my wife besides pack and ship <laughs> and prepare work stuff. So sometimes it's nice to go out and have a, you know, a glass of wine or, or go for a walk. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joe says you get a snark and you get a snark and you get a snark. Everybody gets a snark. I wish that'd be great. I would do that if I could do it in a second. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Derek Savage says, have you played PRS acoustics? I've played many, uh, PRS acoustics and done some reviews of them as well. I really like them. Um, you know, I don't know of a PRS guitar and may, I'm not saying guitar. I don't think I've actually ever played a PRS bass. Isn't that funny? I don't think I physically picked one up. I never carried one as a dealer. Um, not the U.S. ones, not the cut. Well, they, they barely don't make the U.S. ones. I think they only do the private stock now. Um, none of the SEs. So base wise, I don't think I, Nathan even owned one forever. And I don't think he even played his. Um, so I don't know anything about the bases. But when it comes to PRS guitars, S2s, cores, um, SEs, uh, you know, the Bolton series, which would be the the custom 24, CE 24s and the John Mears and stuff. And, um, 
there's not a bad one. So the same with the acoustics, N nothing about it is like, I don't like, there might be a specification I don't like, or the neck profile is something I'm maybe I'm not keen to, but, uh, it's good stuff. It's, it's just, that's what they do. That's the one thing we all know they do really well. Some people think they make the best guitars in the world. That could be true. But what I can tell you what they do is they make consistency. They know how to make like set a bar and just, man, the turds, there's just no turds, <laughs> you know, um, if yeah, that's so there, that's the answer on that. That's what makes it easy. Okay. Uh, Brian says, I've never seen a PRS bass. Just go on their website. You can check them out. They're actually kind of cool looking. I don't know why I've never played one. Just never, never had an opportunity. Okay. Um, let's hit some other questions or subjects. I'm going to refresh this, drink some water. Antique Rocker wants to know if I can compare Mojo, Mojo Tone, uh, the brand Mojo Tone, solderless wiring harnessed to a soldered version advantages or or just the ease of install does it affect guitars resale value so i've actually used the mojo tone solderless systems uh and, and installed them in guitars for myself and for customers um when it comes to the solderless systems versus soldering and doing it i i i would never i'm never gonna make a video comparing how they sound because one, I don't, one, I don't think there's a difference <laughs> and it's one of those things. And if there is a difference, I don't even want to know because it's going to, whatever the difference is going to be, it's going to be too far down the, the geek <laughs> trail to where, you know, I just can't worry about, the, you know, whether a clip and a soldered connection makes a difference. Um, you know, I have friends that build amps and I have friends that repair amps and they talk about the differences of what the connections and how that matters with running current through them and stuff. I totally understand that. But we're talking about guitars here and the guitars, you know, basically we're not running a high high voltage or high current through them. We're not doing anything to like that, that. So to me, clip-on systems are fine. I, I, um, I hope uh, it was communicated clearly, but I've communicated many times in the past, hopefully on the show, but also in the videos, the deep dives I do when I come across guitars like music man or Epiphone that are using the clip system, I say, I don't like them. And here's why I say it. It's because I, it's a pain in the ass for me to work on them. Not that they're bad, <laughs> right? It's a, it's, I want you to take it like when a mechanic says, oh, I hate that car because they hate the way they have to reach in to get something or the way some, an access thing is for them for repair. The quality of the car, in my opinion, or my situation, the quality of the guitar, the component system is not being questioned. Nothing's being questioned. I'm not critiquing the sound of it for that reason. I'm not critiquing anything other than if I have to replace a part, Obviously, I don't have that clip, so I have to pull the clip, cut the clip, you know, <laughs> solder it on. It just takes an extra few minutes, and in repair, that's something you bitch about for some reason. We all bitch about, you know, that took me 10 extra minutes because I guess time is money. I don't know. Sometimes we just like the bitch. I just like the bitch like every repair guy. Um, so uh, that's the only complaint. So when it comes to wireless systems or wire wireless, you know, connections and stuff, uh, absolutely use them. Why not? Use them. They're effective. They're good. I mean, they use them for all kinds of <laughs> industries like model plane industries and stuff, you know, and, 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 and all kinds of things, uh, RC cars, you name it. It's an effective system. You don't have to, you know, have solder connections, uh, in my opinion, in the guitar. Um, however, the last question he, our last part of his question was about resale value. There's nothing that I would say would affect that. As I've, as I've said before, um, when it comes to modifications on guitars. This is another great segue. <laughs> We're gonna have a, this is a lot of segues today. Um, when it comes to modification, modifications on guitars, to me, if you're worried about the value being damaged or hurt on a guitar because you're making modifications, just make sure you make reversible modifications or you make sure that you keep the original parts, no matter how silly they are, whether it's the screws or the little wires or whatever, put that on a bag sandwich a little sandwich bag or something and if you ever sell the guitar include the parts most musicians most meaning on whatever percentage you want to come up with 80 90 percent um are if you said hey i have a guitar here i don't have the it's not you know i put aftermarket pickups i put aftermarket electronics i've done something aftermarket to it and then the next thing you say is but here are the original parts 
and it's included in the sale, most musicians are going to look at that as a, as a plus. They're going to go, wow, cool. I have a choice. Now I can keep the upgrades or I take the upgrades back and put it back to stock and sell off the upgrades or put them in one of my other guitars. It's a bonus. Um, so, so don't worry about the resale value on that. The reason I say that's a great segue is I received an email this week from BV Ninja. BV Ninja sent me a, a nice message and he wanted me to know that uh, Je Jeff McLaren's, McLaren's uh, channel, I'm probably messing up his name. You know, so you know, just for the record, I watched Jeff's video and then I went to his, he has a, a really cool lesson course and I watched him say his own name and he says it so fast that I was having trouble catching it. <laughs> so he said, I almost heard Mac Macklin, Macklin. And I was like, I don't, he's not saying that. So I'm going to spell it for you. It's M-C-E-R-L-A-I-N, right? So I think it's McLaren. But I see McLaren, but I don't think it's right. I think it's McLaren, McLaren, right? So again, I apologize if I'm just, like I said, I was raised hooked on phonics. So every letter means something to my brain, okay? Um, so on his Thursday stream, he did a live stream with the guitar player, Angus Clark. If you don't know Ang Angus Clark, Angus Clark, God, I'm now tongue-tied. Angus Clark, uh, he's in the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. He's also in the uh, the Daredevil Squadron. And they were talking about mods. I watched the, uh, I, I watched it, like you guys watch me probably in Fast Forward, so I can listen to it in the background. Really good show, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, uh, Angus Clark did, a couple shout outs to me and my channel. Thank you for that, Angus. That was super kind of you. And what he was talking about was kind of like the mod theories that I've put out there on the, you know, in the ether on the internet. And, um, which is that, uh, you know, reversible mods, right? You know, doing a, a, a mods to make a guitar even better, but make sure they're reversible. And that's really cool. And, and so this kind of ties into that whole thing. Um, I'm a big proponent for doing your mods, uh, modifying anything. Why not? Uh, but like I said, keep as many of them as reversible as you can, unless of course you're just, you know, in your, in your heart, in your soul, this is the guitar for you. And it's never going to go, by the way, you're lying to yourself. That's a lie. See how sorry. I can't even say that without being sarcastic. Nobody, <laughs> nobody knows. You don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. Think about this. No one knows if that's the guitar forever. Um, you know, when, you know, when, forever passes and then you look back and you go that was the forever guitar <laughs> but until then that's why when people some people do when i say no one i mean the majority 90 percent again some people say i've had the same guitar forever and that's all i need and i'm like great but you are the exception you are far from the rule the rule is everybody's constantly changing their feelings their mind their you know it's just how it works all kinds of things so um so yeah reversible mods are uh, a big thing and also please check you know what? Thank you. Jeff's saying it's Mackerlin? Mackerlin. That's right. I think he said Mackerlin. Like Mackerlin, real fast. Thank you, Jeff. Fletcher. See? Jeff understands my language. He gave me the phonetics on it. So, <laughs> some of you guys are uh, you know what? Either way, I'm going to put a link to his channel. Check out his channel. Look, if I said his name wrong, I apologize. People call me Mac Knight, and everybody says my first name wrong, which is absolutely hilarious. And I won't even tell you what they say wrong because no one notices and I've never said anything to. We're all just creatures of what we're creatures of. We like we like the so like I said, as long as you understand it wasn't personal, I just want to let you know he has a cool channel and a really cool lesson program. Check him out. And uh, of course, check out Angus uh, with the trans Siberian Orchestra or the Daredevil Squadron. All right, uh, let's see. What do we got? Okay, Witchell. Witchell, like Witchell's Donuts, uh, says, Hey, Phil, will you be reviewing the Fender Towmaster Pro? Um, I don't think so. So here's the cool thing. I got to go through one. And uh, my uh, first impression's not so great. Um, and let me share with you why. And first, I want to say none of it was with any of the quality. So I, I can see if, if you've watched tons of videos on this uh, new Tone Master Pro and everybody's like, oh, the quality's great. That was my impression too. The quality's fine. There was a couple decisions. Again, I was just, again, nothing wrong with them. Defender can make whatever they want, product they want. But I, I, I know what product I want. So couple things. Before I say anything about the Tone Master Pro, let me just share with you, and I will put a link, that the although there are some great 
uh, reviews and videos on it. <laughs> My absolute favorite was again from Tone Junkie TV. I will put a link to their video. Uh, they are a great channel if you want to learn about and to my, in my opinion, whether you're a beginner or you're intermediate, or probably even advanced, because these guys talk, you know, <laughs> over my head too, because again, they can really dumb it down for you. He can dumb it down for you, or he can make it complicated. You can pick the video you want to watch for him. But if you want to know anything about Kempers, Axe FX, Line 6, Helix, and, and now in my opinion, the uh, Tone Master Pro, check out his video. It was a really interesting video. And as always, he had some really interesting points. What's great for me was I, when I checked it out, there was a couple of things I was like a little shocked or taken back by. Those were my negatives. I'm going to share with you. He does discuss them in his channel and actually better detail and better than I did. Um, here is my, my thoughts. Uh, one of the things, as you guys know, I have a Tone Master. It's actually here. Look at that, Tone Master. Um, I'm using the Tone Master to cover up the wall war right there. I just thought it looked ugly, so I put the Tone Master there because it weighs nothing. I can pick it up and put it there. So that's a Tone Master, Deluxe uh, 65 Tone Master. I love this amp, as you, I've told you guys. Um, I, my only complaint about it was really, it was expensive. <laughs> and of course, now with inflation, I guess, I don't know, right? I don't know if they're, everything's expensive. Um, so here's what's interesting about it. Um, I love it. I really am hoping, right, that Fender will come out with a Fender Basement 59 Tone Master. I just want the, the Basement 59 Tone Master. And I want the Fender Basement 59 Tone Master more than the Basement 59 because the Basement 59 is two ohms. And I got rid of mine that I had years ago because um, at the time I had to have it modified. And then I had a, uh, a hot plate put on it, which was like a two ohm hot plate. And it was just a pain in the butt. And the idea that they could make a basement, 59 basement, lighter, <laughs> but more importantly, have a built-in attenuation, because that's what I like to do with the basement, like a Marshall. I like to crank that sucker up, right? Um, and I was really hoping they would do that. So you could understand why my first impression of the Tone Master Pro is not great when the first thing I wanted to do in it was find the Fender Basement 59. I'm like, okay, you know, if anyone's gonna knock the Fender Basement 59 off, it's gonna be Fender and they're gonna do it great. And it doesn't even exist, <laughs> right? Now it's just not, it's not true. I guess actually that was in there. I'm just being a smart ass. Uh, but what my point was, there was a lot of the Fender amps that were missing from it. So I was a little shocked. But overall, I thought the quality was really good. I just want to be dramatic because um, I really want to point out that I really want a Fender Basement 59 Tone Master. <laughs> um, but as a product, I think that, like I said, I, I stick with actually my impressions of it last week where I thought... Um, it's up, it's up against the Helix, and I think it's going to do a great job. The The only thing, like I said, my curiosity was there was a lot of amps in there that were not in there that I was shocked about. Um, not so much the non-Fender amps. There was a lot of non-Fender amps in there, of course, I didn't see in there. Um, I saw they did like a Friedman kind of thing, and that was really good. Um, um, obviously, some Marshalls, that was really cool. They... Um, but none of the, there was like a whole lot, a bunch of tweed amps not in there. Um, there was like one Vox amp in there. So again, you know, um, so <laughs> don't, don't 50, don't, two, two, five, one says the 59 basement was the first in the list. I know I'm being smart ass. Um, it's cause like I said, it was in there. It's just, like I said, I really want them to make the basement 59, the real amp. <laughs> so, um, so it was good. So like I said, so there's a lot of stuff that I thought was missing in it, but that's just like, oh, that would be really cool if that was in there. But quality-wise, I thought it was quality. Like I said, sound-wise, I thought it sounded pretty good. I thought it was pretty good, like I said. Um, but like I said, I would check out the Tone Junkies TV review because they actually found some issues, not negatives, just some issues to show you guys some stuff, and I thought that was interesting. But overall, uh, my first impression, I only got to check it out a little bit, but it was pretty cool. So there you go. <laughs> All right, we have Amanda sent me a message saying, Bob says, hey, Phil, love the show. Do you know if American Pro or Johnny Marr Jaguar can be converted from the slider to the three-way switches? I am not digging the the Ventura 2 Jags. Um, can they be? I don't, well, the, 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 the answer I have is, I don't know, I'm not looking at them, so I don't know for sure if they can be modified. Um, so sadly enough, I don't know if I know. I don't know. Let me look at one. I want to look at the American Pro, if that's okay. The Johnny Marr. Hold on. I just want to see. If I can see it. 
Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's really weird. Okay, so that's the Jazz Master. There's the Jaguar. Yeah, I don't see. There's a professional too. That's what I really wanted. Jazz Master again. I gotta love a search. Here's the Johnny Marr. Well, let's just pull up the Johnny Marr. So basically, what you want to know is if you can convert it to the three minute, the three switches from the one five. Is that a five position? It's been a while since I played this guitar. Five or three position. The answer is yes. Here's why I'm saying the answer is yes. I'm looking at a couple things right now, and what I'm seeing is uh, all you need is space. You need space to put the electronics and fit everything. Will it just pop in? It doesn't look like it's all going to be pop-in ready, but yeah, you can modify it. So, so that's the yeah, my, my guess is yes. Okay, so where's the? Hold on a second. All right, <laughs> like looking at mul multiple multiple screens again. Where do I go back? Oh, here it is. Okay, so the next one is from Brian who says, hey, both Sweetwater and Guitar Center have new PRSSE models marked down $150, $200. Strange considering that they were just released. Recommend. We already talked about that. Thank you, Brian, for mentioning it. But oh, so, you know, I didn't mention uh, Guitar Center. I apologize. Like I said, I, I mentioned Reverb, Sweetwater, and all that stuff. But And funny enough, a little funny kind of uh, side thing that happened this week was really interesting. Um, and it's probably wasn't something I was going to say, but now, right now, it sounds like maybe it's an opportunity to say this. So I got a message for somebody that asked me if the reason I don't like Guitar Center, it was a valid question. I'm not offended by it anyways. The reason do I, I don't like Guitar Center, whatever that means, and, and I like Sweetwater is because I got, I get money from Sweetwater and I don't get money from Guitar Center. Um, so it, very valid question. And you know what? You should challenge people and you should ask those kind of questions. There's nothing wrong with asking that. Nothing wrong, right? Um, I would find no offense in, in being asked that. Um, in fact, I'm sure some of you probably want to know. Here's the interesting funny fact about this. Uh, currently, Sweetwater pays me about 4% on average if you make a purchase. So I have a link down below. If you click that link, okay, and... Um, you click the link uh, to sweetwater.com and you make a purchase, I will receive about 4%. I say about because I get different percentages, like if it's in stock or if you're the first time buying there or not. But so we'll just say it's an average of 4%. So obviously you can do the math on that. If you spend $100, I get like four bucks. So um, sweet, <laughs> that's cool. Guitar Center, I actually am set up as an affiliate with them. I get 10%. I get two and a half times more if you buy from Guitar Center. Um, so the question is, well, if that's that's true, well, one, it's true. And whether you guys realize it or not, if you go to some of my videos, I do have affiliate links to Guitar Center as well on those links. Um, and if you click those, I get two and a half times more if, I get, if you go to Sweetwater. But I prefer Sweetwater personally, so I, don't tell you where I think it would benefit me financially. I tell you where I where I spend my money. Um, I haven't bought anything from Guitar Center in probably a year. Usually, when I buy from Guitar Center, it is um, it's used gear, right? Um, I buy most of my new stuff if I'm buying online from a chain and I'm not buying from a mom and pop or something. Um, I buy from Sweetwater. Like I said, last week I needed some strings. I drove to Milano's, which is a music store down in Mesa, and we bought a bunch of packs of strings. Um, had an interesting experience there. <laughs> I don't know if I should share it, <laughs> but it was good. It was a interesting experience. Um, and uh, But uh, yeah, if I buy on line, a lot of times I just go to Sweetwater because uh, I like the way I like the way they do business on a, on a business level. So that's why I use them. Um, even I question my logic sometimes because I go to click it because I use my own affiliate link when I buy from Sweetwater because <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, if I spend a hundred bucks, I get four bucks back. That's pretty cool. It's almost the tax. And, um, sometimes I go, I should, I should click and buy it at Guitar Center because I'll get 10% off and instead I don't. So it's, uh, there you go. So, uh, the answer to your question is that why I promote Sweetwater over Guitar Center is because they pay me, uh, no, because Guitar Center is already, they want, they all, they pay me more if I take the money 
Well, you know, if you if I promote them. So there you go. Personally, I'll just tell you, buy buy from who you want. Buy from a mom and pop shop, like I said. And always, if it's especially if it's not like a cut pack of strings or something, or if you like these like these PRSSEs, you're not probably going to get an extra deal from Sweetwater it, besides the 20%. Um, call in, get a deal, and put that money in your pocket. Like I said, put 10% in your pocket, 15% in your pocket, rather than give me 4%. I, I'd rather uh, I'd rather that every time, like I said. I'd rather you guys um, do that. Ronan says, 69 says, Milano's do tell. So first, I just want to tell you, this is what I, I just want to share this with you. Milano's a great store. I've been going there for years and years. They've been there since 1946. And if you're doing the math, that's the same year Fender started. Great store. Um, I try to support all the small stores or, you know, they're not that small, but, you know, businesses around my area, of course, um, and went to strings. So we went and get strings. And what happened was, as you can imagine, um, when we went to the strings, my wife went with me and uh, I... Um, I went rogue. <laughs> we walked in the store and I just started looking at guitars and daydreaming and looking at the ceiling and going, you know, wherever. <laughs> and my wife was like, well, she knew what I needed. Uh, I needed two packs of seven strings and two packs of hybrid strings. And so she went right to the string area and she couldn't find them. She was having trouble finding them. So after about five minutes of me wandering around the store being useless, uh, I moseyed on back to where she was. And she's like, I can't find them. And I go, oh, they're right there. And she's like, oh, I didn't see them because, you know, they're different packaging. And um, and uh, and I told I bought the strings. They were super nice and great. As we were leaving, I made the comment that they were super nice. I said it was a great experience. I said I didn't find anything to buy. I was hoping maybe I could buy something for the channel, but you know, I just didn't see anything to buy for that moment. And I said, they were really nice. They helped me like three times. One guy was asking me about guitars and she goes, you know, no one said a single thing to me. <laughs> she goes, and I was looking for product the whole time. And I was like, oh, so yeah, that's the interesting part. We were like, we thought that was kind of interesting. We're like, oh, they didn't say hello to her, even though she was looking for strings the entire time. So, and so, you know, one, one of the employees was a female. So there you go. Um, the reason why I said I was apprehensive of saying that is because I don't really, I still like the store. My wife was totally fine with it. It was more of an observation than it was like a complaint. Obviously the service was fine. Just my wife thought that was kind of, she said that was kind of strange. She's like, yeah, they helped you like three times. They didn't help me once. So I don't know. There you go. All right, uh, Brad Guitar Miller says, Phil, love the uh, the P-Up videos. <laughs> I think he says pop-up videos. Uh, these, I'm sh the shorts. Uh, would you do a video of actual winding pickups? What results uh, were you looking for? Uh, want to start winding my own pickups? Um, PTM products line, thank you. So this is a good question. Uh, about winding pickups. I have tons of videos showing me just doing the wind. I don't specifically have a video of like a start to finish on how to make a pickup. Um, if I do that video, it will definitely be, I have a ton. Uh, I don't know why I do, <laughs> um, but I have a ton in the store. I have a ton of pickup kits that I've bought from everybody from Mojo Tone and, and Stu Max. So I was thinking about taking a pickup kit, like a single Hoyer P90 and making a pickup. Um, the question became, um, you know, do I, you know, I was going to do a winding video of like one of the pickups I make and then share it with everybody. And when I filmed it and at the end of it, I was watching going, I don't know if I want everybody to see some of the stuff in there. There's again, there's no, like I have a secret sauce and no one knows. Um, it's not that it's just, um, you know, uh, I do have one pickup in particular that is different and I like, and I, you know, um, uh, and so there you go. But I will share a standard, like a kit build uh, pickup with you. Um, and also I should point out, there's a project I'm working on with that pickup that I'm making right now with, with a, another larger company. And I also don't want to share it until that's done. So there you go. Cause again, then they might take the, take it and may not need me to make the only, the pickup that we're working together on. Um, so, but that's to answer your question. Yeah, we can do that. Like I said, I, I'll, I'll do it. I thought about doing a start to finish one. It's really fun. There's tons of great videos of them out there as well too, but I'll, I'll definitely make one. I, I know sometimes it's not about, uh, you know, somebody else made one. I think it's, you know, you like the channel, maybe you like the vibe and you'd like to see me do it. I, I get that. I'm the same way. Some channels I've seen things beaten to death and then there's a channel I like a little bit more than the other channels and I watch them do it just because I like them. Uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, for the tone jar and why not? I finally have a metal guitar. You got the Jackson, a Jackson DK2. 
not sure if I love it. Well, you know, you did start off with saying you hate Floyd Roses, <laughs> but I don't hate it. If you guys remember a couple weeks ago, he asked um, about, um, he asked about, <laughs> he asked about uh, getting a Floyd Rose when he hates it. And I said, he should chew it uh, because if you ask if you should buy a guitar, the answer is yes. He got the guitar. He says, now I need a hex hider. They are really cool. Um, if I have any extra ones, maybe I can send one out. They, uh, I just don't know if I have any. I think I actually, I think I'm in deficient of them right now. Actually, it's funny enough for the Badlands uh, Hollow Flash uh, launch. We need as many as we can get for that. Um, PW says new guitar day Squire 40th anniversary vintage Strat on deep discount. That's the time right now. Uh, tuning seems to be super sta stable. Satin is satin neck is sweet. Uh, also bought a Swedish lute. <laughs> nice. A few months ago. Uh, uh, that's cool. I, I know what a lute is and that's about all I know. Um, I have no idea how to say this name, but it says greetings from Hanner. Hi, Hanner. It's nice to see you again or hear from you again. That's really cool. Let's see. And let me go back to, I'm going to jump around a little bit if you don't mind. So this was a question I got uh, on today's show that was one of the first earlier rise questions. It says, do you have any thoughts of the new CEO of Sweetwater, uh, Mike Clem? Do you think it will change the customer experience in any way? So if you guys don't know, maybe this is not interesting to you. I will keep it brief, but I think it's interesting, especially if it's brief. There is a new CEO of Sweetwater, as you guys know. Um, basically, that's just Chuck Surak has is on the board of directors still. So, you know, Chuck Surak started Sweetwater. He started out of a van. If you guys know the story of Sweetwater. It's really crazy. He started, <laughs> he started recording people out of his minivan, or not minivan, just a little van. And then, you know, that's how the business started. Um, Chuck Sirac, um, I think 2019, around that time, basically Sweetwater was pitch, uh, purchased or acquired majority-wise by a, uh, a large company, right? A venture capital company. We have a whole episode on that. The entire internet predicted the end of Sweetwater. And of course, now they're bigger than ever before. And they're still nice as hell when it comes to how they still handle majority of their things. Um, so nothing's really changed from what I can tell. The, the only change specifically that I know that is negative in any way is the 55 point inspections used to be at $300 and up on guitars. And now it's $400 and up on guitars. And that had to do with inflation. That's just inflation. Um, there's not even that many guitars under $300 anymore. I mean, let's just face it. It's not not a not a not a pretty scene when it comes to guitars, affordable guitars under uh, three hundred dollars by legitimate retail retailers. Usually, if you want a decent guitar under three hundred dollars, now you got to go on Amazon and find all these off brands that you know pop up on YouTube channels, and even that gets dodgy sometimes. So the point is, Chuck Sirac is now on the board of directors, and uh, Mike Klim has been named the new CEO. He's an interesting thing about that. So Mike Klim used to be like the marketing. Uh, well, he's been a, done, a, done a ton of things as we water, but he used to be the marketing guy um, and did advertise, you know, handled advertising and social media and all that stuff back in the day. Um, so he's a promoted within person. He is a work from the ranks person. If you guys don't know who Mike Klim is, I don't know what his bio says. I don't know what uh, articles say. Um, I haven't read any of that. I'm going to tell you what I know is to be true besides what, you know, they can be stating out there. Mike Klim is a work for, from the ranks person. Um, Jack Higginbotham, as you guys know, I did a podcast with him. It's on my second channel is the COO of Paul Reesmith guitars it started in 1980. Five, I guess, as a sander, right? He sanded guitars, okay? So there's a chance that if you buy an 84, 85, 86 Paul Reed Smith or 85, 86, 87 Paul Reed Smith, that the COO of the company now sanded, polished, buff, worked on your guitar. And then to be honest with you, for years after that, he probably either assembled it, built it, right? He worked on your guitar. He is a working Joe who becomes COO. Mike Klim is the same thing. He's a working stiff like us, like the majority of us, he worked at, uh, at Sweetwater and he has worked up the ranks and now he's the CEO of the company. He, they didn't pull him from Coca-Cola or another giant, you know, billion dollar company. Um, he wasn't brought in, uh, you know, sideways. He, you know, like I said, he wasn't, he's not the son of the investor, none of that stuff. He, it's crazy. Um, and f so the reason I'm sharing that is because you don't hear that, especially when a venture capital company, um, buys a company, right? The last thing you hear is a year or two later after they buy them, 
a, one of the employees gets promoted to CEO, right? Or CEO, right? That's crazy. And the reason I can tell you that is because here's important to understand. And I believe this, and I said this years ago when this uh, deal happened based on what I know behind the scenes. When the company came in and acquired, essentially acquired Sweetwater, you got to understand they knew what they were buying. Sweetwater has done something unique and different. I say that knowing quite well that I obviously am friends with the Sam Ash people. Sam Ash is a great store. There's a lot of great stores. Sweetwater, though, what they did is they captured the big store. They've become a big store that captured kind of a mom and poppy kind of vibe. In other words, you, you get like, you know, the candy. I know it's silly. And that the fact they follow up with you and stuff. There's some corporate vibe. Don't get me wrong. And they're not perfect and they're far from it. But they were able to, to keep it this way and they treat their employees really, really well. So um, there you go. So the answer to your question is, what do I think about? Was the actual question, what do I think of Mike Klim? Or just what do I think? Do you think they will change the customer experience in any way? I think he's going to make it better. I think he's, uh, I think he's, uh, drinks the Kool-Aid, man. I think he believes in sweet water. Um, the, um, you know, I have to tell you, this is a horrible, horrible, I'm so stupid. I just got to tell you how stupid I am. Okay. First of all, um, and I must love you guys. I don't even know you people. I must love you. Cause what I'm about to say, my wife watches the show. She's going to cringe. I can see my wife <laughs> cringing as I'm going to say this. The Sweetwater people are so nice. That when I brought my wife in June to Sweetwater, I warned her ahead of time that it's going to have a cultish kind of vibe, that they're going to be like really like pro Sweetwater and really nice. And when I said that to her, I didn't mean like the marketing people or the people that are there to make help me make content. I go, the guy who's going to serve you coffee, the person on the phone, the janitor, <laughs> right? The Everyone that works there has got this like, I'm so happy to work here kind of vibe. Now, don't get me wrong. No company's perfect. There's a couple of people who probably weren't so happy to be there, but the majority of people, and I said, it's weird. And then she went there and she's like, yeah, they were really nice. And she goes, and she said, she goes, I don't know if I would say culty. And she goes, but I know what you meant. It kind of like, wow, everybody's really nice. Like, I hope they're not like either they're really happy or they're really afraid, <laughs> but but they're really happy. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, and the reason I said I'm, I'm stupid for saying that is I, I hope I'm not offending anyone that, that works at Sweetwater that met me at the event. I don't want to sound like that was negative. It's very positive. You guys have a very positive vibe and you seem very happy. And I thought that was cool. So um, I think Mike Clem's going to basically, he's that. He's going to take the company and make it better. And I think, so there you go. There, That's my, I think we talked too long on that. Uh, Tom O'Hawk says, I like how it's a Tom O'Hawk. Tom O'Hawk says, Josh, Josh Smith signature guitar is $2,700 US dollars made in Indonesia. Too much for guitar not made in USA and Japan, question mark. Dude, I love that you're asking me the question and not just saying it. Like, that's too much. Is it too much? You know, no. Here's why. Here's why. Um, Strandbergs are that price made in Indonesia. Um, the price of a guitar is slowly becoming not just where it's made. It's a little bit of what specifications are on it. Um, it's a little bit of the artist royalties. Look, we got to get artist royalties in there. These guys got to get paid. They're not selling tens of thousands of guitars, right? Um, Josh Smith, if you guys don't know who Josh Smith is, he's like one of the best blues players currently playing in, in, in the world, okay? I mean, there's no, in my opinion, there's no question about that. He's just off the charts, right? Um, this is the guy that stands on stage and he can stand on stage with somebody like Joe Bonamassa and he's just tearing it up and you're just like, I don't know who I love more, right? You're just left and right in it. Like, this is great, right? A little bit of different sauce on each of their playing, but great. Um, but that being said, I don't know how much royalty, I hope he gets a lot. I hope he gets a big chunk for, for working with Ivanez and making that guitar. I think he deserves it. The reality is, like I said, you know, the days, the, the, the days of giving these artists like a very small royalty and then waiting to see it pan out, there's just not a lot of volume there. They're not going to sell. You can't sell, a, you know, 10,000 Josh Smith guitars, 20,000, 30,000 Josh Smith guitars. Um, uh, it's, it's just, you know, there's not Van Halen anymore. It's not Vive. I sold a million gems. There's no, I don't know if anyone's going to sell a million guitars. Um, and here's why we know why it's the same reason why, um, there's this great video series. I'm going to link it when I do this thing. There's a great video series. My wife and I have been addicted to it all week on YouTube and it's every hit song from 1955 to now by month. 
there's a playlist. I'm going to give it to you guys. It's freaking awesome. Okay. So I, I recommend, highly recommend just pick January and just go forward. We jumped around to everybody's birthday month and then it got a little confusing. So it's every hit song, literally for the month of January, every hit song that was a number one song in the US. But if you're in Europe, you can pick the European one too. Um, the, um, hit song from 55 all the way to 2020. It's like 2020, 2021, and it stops, right? And uh, it was a lot of fun and listening to music. And here's what you see. You see exactly what you know you're going to see. It's like, man, all of a sudden it's like, okay, here's a song. Here's a song. Oh, it's Elvis. Oh, it's Elvis. Oh, it's Elvis. Oh, it's Elvis. Oh, it's the Beatles. Oh, it's the Beatles. Oh, it's the Beatles. It's the Beatles, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then now when you watch now, when it gets closer to, to the now of hit songs, it's all over the place, right? Like, you know, you get the eighties and it's Madonna, it's Madonna, it's Madonna, it's Madonna. Like they just dominated artists, dominated the charts. I don't know if that's because there was less of them. I don't know what that is. Maybe they're more talented. I don't actually think that, by the way, I think some of the newer songs actually, some are better than some of the old songs. I enjoyed all of it, but I can tell you that you can tell that the pool got bigger each year. You know, the artist talent pool is bigger. And the reality is this, the same thing, right? You know, it's not, Steve I, when you, when we were, you know, those of you who were into Ibanez, Steve I guitars in the eighties, there was like, you know, think of the list of the guitar players. The list was long, long, like 12, 20, 30 guitar players. Now you can't even name half these guitar players because they're all over on social media. This is a TikTok star. This one's in a band, this, right? This, so it's, it's a little crazy. So, um, so I think that's part of it. The royalties are going to have to go up the percentage of royalties they pay to artists for that reason. The other thing about the Indonesian guitar is just, just the market. It's just what it is. It, they're, they're, they're pricing it not only comparative to their other products, but, um, but they're also comparing it to, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, specs of other instruments like you know, USA ones and stuff. So the question about USA, Japan and, and Indonesian guitars, when it comes to how I feel about it now, me personally, is I prefer to, I prefer to buy USA guitars because I live in the USA and I, I want workers in the USA working. That's, that's it. That's like my first thought on that exact, you know, so what I mean by that <laughs> is this is a guitar. This guitar I'm pointing at, I'm pointing at a frame right now. This was made in Germany, okay? Um, of course, this Paul Smith SE is made in Indonesia, and this Gibson is made in the USA. And if you and uh, this E-Art guitar that I can't seem to point at, so you know, is made in China. So on this wall right here, we have Germany, we have Indonesia, China, and USA. I'm trying to see if there's any ones. Oh, there's a made in Japan. Ivan is right there, Okay. I'm trying to think if there's any other countries covered on this wall. I don't have any made in Mexico right now. Um, of course, if I can employ Americans, I want to employ Americans. I'm sure if you live in Germany, you want to employ in Germany. If you want to live in Mexico, you want to employ uh, Hispanic people, Mexicans, right? Um, it's basically, you know, if you live in Japan, you know, same thing. Um, so there's a little bit of loyalty I give there. But after that, it's just quality guitars, wherever they are. I don't really care. So, um, and part of that, so, you know, actually, and just to be clear, cause I don't want to confuse anybody. Part of that statement I just made about, you know, employing Americans is not because I'm actually even employing Americans like on a pride level. There's a little bit of that. I just know a lot of people at these factories. I know these employees. I know them personally. I know their names, their families. I know a lot of them. So of course I think of them from time to time when I'm buying things. I'm like, oh, there's a Dane Electro in Korea. Same thing. <laughs> okay. So, so like I said, sometimes I think, ah, hey, of course, do I think of people like Nathan? Do I think of, uh, you know, all my other friends and all the other factories and other jobs? And I go, man, I should really support them. Of course I think of that. That's what I think of. But quality wise, I don't know. I don't know if you could say, um, I, I, I can't, I think Indonesia guitars are some of the best guitars out there in the market. I think some of the Korean guitars, are the best guitars in the market. I've said this before. The Schecter guitars are fantastic. There's a lot of great guitars. They're all over the world now. They're just great. Okay, next. Hold on a second. Okay, and how are we doing? We're doing great on time. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say, I, I don't know. It's Ellie and the TH. So I'm going to say 
L-E-T-H, uh, says, I keep staring at the purplish paint guitar hanging on the wall. Yeah. You know, what's funny is after the video, Jack Higginbotham sent me a really nice um, email uh, saying he enjoyed the video, which was really nice, kind of him to do. And he said that, uh, obviously, I critiqued the guitar saying I wish they would have rolled the fretboard more or, you know, it would be a nicer thing. He said, um, he didn't say they're going to do that. He just said, they were thinking the th same thing, and they he said he has some prototype necks. They're gonna. I don't know if I should said that. I didn't really clear with him, but here's the deal. They're they're looking at maybe do, doing rolled SE fretboards. That'd be cool if they do it. But he told me that if we when we get a chance, if we next time we meet, he's gonna tell me how they do the finish on this because they do a different stain finish. That the, I guess it's a new stain way to do stain on that finish or a new way. So I'm really excited. I'll share that with you guys as long as he's okay with me sharing it. So. Okay. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Um. Hold on a second. And like I said, if you have a question for me or a subject, you know what's funny is I saw. There it is, Rob. Um, Rob did a super chat says first super, super chat. I'm so pumped, dude. That is crazy. He, you did. Thank you so much. He just super chatted like $5 million. So, um, thank you for that. I appreciate that. The, okay. Hold on. I'm just going through questions, seeing if I missed anything. Same thing with moderators. Have you guys got anything to send me? Um, let me know. Um, since I got a second, I'll, sh I'll share this with you guys real quick. Uh, last week I shared this with you as, uh, as you guys, I don't know. Okay. Uh, we did a run of know your gear zither stands. These are the, the mahogany stands that have the logo lasered in them. And so I put a link to those down below. I want to thank you guys for every single one of you that bought them. I really appreciate that. We sold 15 of them, which I was actually pretty shocked. Uh, I thought we were going to sell, I, to be honest, I thought we were going to sell 10. <laughs> I was like, we could probably sell 10. And uh, we sold 15. So that was really, really cool. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to everyone who bought one. If you want to buy one, uh, you can check the link down below. We shipped out all 15 this week. So everybody either should have theirs now or you'll be, you, you should be receiving it really soon because like I said, every single one of them was shipped out earlier in the week. Um, Got to give props to the Zither people, man. They literally, my wife sent the orders on Monday to them. They literally made them and got them shipped out and she confirmed all the, all the tracking numbers were active and moving. So thank you for that. Same thing this week. If you guys put order any of these, they'll get them out next week for you guys. Um, and then we'll take a hiatus from them because again, like kind of like the giveaways, I kind of, kind of keep my, you know, I want to keep everybody focused on more things than just, you know, Hey, sell some stance to you guys, but I just want to let you guys know. Thank you guys. Again, I appreciate that. And I just want to let you know again, cause I did it last week and I think it worked, which is this stand is very expensive. It's $189. It's, it's definitely a luxury item. I have a really cool video on the stand. You should watch it. When I bought my first zither stands, that's how I became friends with the zither people is I bought a stand and they really liked the video. And then, you know, they're like, Hey, let's work together. Um, so my point is, is that they make a, this exact stand. <laughs> I'm such a dummy. <laughs> share it. Don't share that with people. I'm going to share it. Uh, they make this exact stand, of course, in, I think it's an oak. So it's lighter. It looks really light. It's an oak. And it, of course, it doesn't have the new year laser cut into it three-dimensionally. But it's like half the price of this. You can get two of those for the one of these. So, um, so please, if you want to just get the stand, uh, hundred dollars is still crazy expensive, but still you can get, you know, for the half the price, you can get one of those. It's the same cradle. It's made in Texas, same stand, just Oak instead of mahogany. It doesn't have a know your gear logo logo. Hey, but you could get a know your gear sticker on there. If you want to stick it or put your own sticker on there. But either way, I just want to let you know that if you're buying the stand, it's just really to promote, to help the channel. you know, obviously we get some money and, um, and then of course, you know, you get a, uh, we used to call it limited because the last one was discontinued. We don't know when we're going to discontinue this one, um, but we don't do that logo again. So it kind of makes it fun. But like I said, if you just care about the stand because the stand is really kick ass, just buy the buy the more price friendly ones. 
So, um, okay. My, oh, great question. XXXXX says, your guitar stand, will a flying V fit on it? Yeah, believe it or not, it will fit a flying V. It will fit the Firebird. It will fit a Destroyer. Um, and it fits most bases, but not all. So be be um, be cautious. But you'd have to have a pretty extremely long V. Um, probably the Dean V would be a little scary. So like a Gibson V definitely fits on the stands. Uh, a Jackson V definitely st st stands, but some of the V's like Dean are just a little longer and they could get problematic, but even then, but you can clarify that on their website too, but just, so you know, it should be, it should be pretty good to go for that. Um, I haven't put anything on it other than like, uh, really long basses that this, you know, bass guitars that have been just a little too long. Everything else fits pretty fine. Okay. T-Spin wants to know what I would recommend for a travel guitar. Well, I reviewed so many travel guitars on the channel and you didn't say acoustic or electric. So that's tricky. So, um, I mean, I'll tell you for an acoustic, my favorite travel guitar is still the Inya uh, guitar I reviewed. That's got all the views that I did the little Inya guitar. That thing's kick ass. I still have it. Um, still use it. Still play it. It's it, you get non-electric or electric version. If you get the electric, it does reverb and stuff. That's really cool. I highly recommend that as a travel acoustic guitar. It's brutally it takes it takes all brutality and it's super inexpensive. And even then, if I every once in a while I get to see the comments on that video, everybody's telling me they're constantly on sale. So, dude, just ah, uh, if you can get it on sale on Amazon, get that that one for for acoustic for sure. For electric, um, you know, I, I don't know. If I would recommend an actual travel electric guitar, there's some, like I've tried all the, you know, foldy uppy necky ones and the, and here's what I came down to for me. Let me, let me look before I suggest this. And here's why, um, because it's a price thing. Okay. Um, I just had this happen to me the other day where I recommend something and I, cause I thought it was like 200 bucks and then somebody's like, it's 650. And I'm like, wow, did the times have changed? Okay. I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Okay. So here's my answer to your question. What guitar would I pick? And I, I, I'm not going to tell you what guitar I think you should pick. That doesn't make any sense. I'm going to say what pick would I guitar would I pick for travel? It's going to be the E Art headless guitar. That's what I would take for travel. That guitar, um, unless you need something even smaller than that. But to me, um, the reason I say that is um, that's what I use for travel. Is I use a headless guitar. So I have a headless Kiesel and I have headless Str Strandberg. I absolutely love them. But both those guitars are very expensive. You know. Um, the Strandberg and the Kiesel are both expensive. And, uh, I obviously, obviously it's one of the perks of the channel is I get, you know, to work with these companies sometimes and Strandberg let me keep that guitar. Remember I interviewed him, we did a video and stuff and then they're like, you can keep the guitar. So I had that for travel. The Kiesel one as well was, was, was given to me and it's actually not given to me for a video. That's what you've never seen a video of that Kiesel. <laughs> the one I have now, the one you have seen is the Kiesel Delos. They sent me that currently Ralph has and uses as his main guitar. Um, so, uh, um, but, uh, I would say if I was going to get a headless guitar for travel affordable, that ER guitar I reviewed is fantastic. Um, and I mean, stainless steel frets, it's, it's really good. And I think for travel, it'd be more than adequate for you. And it's $300. So again, that sounds expensive. Okay. Cause $300 is a lot of money, but for anybody in the comment section, before you say anything, cause you're going to say something, I just know it. Um, most of the travel guitars I've reviewed on the channel are way more than that. Travel guitars are not cheap. Even travel, the brand travel guitars, their little guitars, little, little teeny guitars. They make, they're still three, $400 so expensive. So I would probably go with something like that. So. Ricky wants to know if I own a Dean guitar or Jackson Kelly. I don't. Uh, the only extreme body shape I have is the Firebird Gibson, which that video comes out in November. Uh, but that's it. HK says, do the Ertz, uh, E-Arts, whatever you want, weigh the same? No, the, er the Ertz on average are going to be heavier than, first of all, the Strandbergs are super light. My Strandberg's like four pounds. My Kiesel's like six pounds. Uh, so... Nothing's going to be as light as the Strandbergs because they're not only super small, but they're chambered, super small and chambered. Um, the uh, E-Art guitar is not, the E-Art guitar can be as heavy as eight pounds, just like anything else. 
sadly enough, Amazon doesn't weigh guitars like Sweetwater. <laughs> so so that's that one thing. You could try and, and try to find a used one and see if somebody will weigh it for you and stuff. But um, so. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> Susan says, I'm reading these out of order. Susan says, oh, the Firebrand, uh, Fiber fans heard that and will hold you to it. Well, it's definitely going to happen because that video is sponsored by uh, the Country Music Association. So uh, the uh, one of the one of the things I've been doing, as you guys know, periodically throughout the year is um, instead of doing like the, you know, sometimes we take the patron funds and we buy some guitars and we do the videos on the channel. And then sometimes companies send guitars and we do those guitars on the channel. And then sometimes what's nice is um, we have these... Um, I don't know what you call it, but the, the, the term, so you know, in the industry it, that we use is integration. Uh, so like Skillshare, the Country Music Association, there's a few others where you have to do a shout out in the video. And you know, you talk, you know, you guys seen it too, right? Like VPNs, right? And they always have those thin wallet things. And I kind of bind myself to things I use, do, or understand. Like I, I just can't like, hey, everybody check out this thing. I don't know what it is. So I try to do products that I either use or I, you know, I can understand them, you know, why I would want them or why some of you guys might be interested in it. And um, they do what's called integration. You just say something for about 30 seconds or so, and then they'll sponsor your video. And then what's great is I use those sponsor funds to, to buy the guitar and do the video and stuff like that. That's what I did with that. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, if I heard of Edge Guitars in India, I have not. But I will check them out this weekend. Um, okay. Uh, T spin says, what other instruments do I play? Just bass and guitar. That's it. Mm. That's it. Nothing exciting there. Um, okay. Hold on a second. Sorry. I'm jumping around. It's funny. Uh, the name is Miserable Turd. It's a great name. It says, uh, will that guitar stand work with an EDS 1275? I have to look. Now I'm curious. I love it. And the answer is uh, no. <laughs> it will not. For the record, uh, EDS 1275 is this uh i don't know i'll accept all cookies okay let's do it come on now the office okay uh this is the guitar he's talking about uh double neck it would not fit on that the um the uh zither stands are balanced this is important and like i said you really um if you're thinking about getting one of these stands you should really look at the um the video i did <laughs> where i show you how i knock things around and do stuff with it. And so the reason that's important is they're balanced. So that guitar would knock it off its balance. It wouldn't work. Remember the whole point of these stands is not that they look like pretty furniture is that they actually functionally work, um, uh, to, to kind of make it exciting for you guys. Maybe if you haven't seen the video or I did it, I took, um, a $5,000 Paul Reed Smith, four or $5,000 crazy price PRS guitar, put it on there. And, uh, now keep in mind at that time, it wasn't worth that. It was worth three grand, which was, you know, the equivalent of $5,000 back then a few years ago, put it on there and just try to knock it over. <laughs> it was crazy. It was, um, even I had to examine my sanity. <laughs> so Michael says two stands that won't work either. Um, and then we have, uh, I never know how to say this. Teaster Teaster says showing gratitude. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And then let's grab a couple more. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, this one came from New Mexico Saint says the shorts you, you have been doing on pickups are great. Is wax potting the only way to kill microphonics? You know, it's funny. I don't know. For, there's there is lacquer potting okay they do dip pickups in lacquer which is essentially going to be the same thing okay so the lacquer and the and there is there's mixes um 
So like you can mix uh, wax with beeswax. So paraffin wax and beeswax, and you can have a mix, mix of that. You can do paraffin. I've seen them do paraffin wax and lacquer. Uh, and of course, I've seen them actually dip them in just lacquer. Okay. Um, and I don't know of any other materials that I've seen off the hand done or dissected pickups that are done uh, any other way. Um, the solution I use for my pickups are just paraffin. I just like the way it is. I don't have to get fancy. I tried all the other ways. I didn't try lacquer. Okay. So I tried the beeswax way and stuff. It worked okay. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just preference what I like working with and what I like and what, how it worked for me is what it did it. So there is of course lacquer, uh, beeswax and then paraffin and then combinations of those. There might be some other ways to do it. Those are the main ways. Um, but like I said, it's one of those things like it ain't broke. Don't fix it. Those ways work really effectively and essentially very cheaply right? It does. It does. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Somebody says Eddie ruined a bunch of pickups before getting it right. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, you know, what's interesting is that, um, why this is an interesting story is when I say they dip it in a lacquer, it's hot as well. Like they heat it up and dip it in there and, um, they have to run the, the reason why Eddie ruined some pickups. There's a famous story that Eddie ruined a, uh, like a, a pickup out of an ES 35 again, doing this story off memory. Um, that um, he melted the, the bobbins on the pickup melted because the melting point of the lacquer was hot enough to where basically that's the melting point of the plastic. <laughs> um, so, so basically that's one of the drawbacks of doing the lacquer. You know, interesting. T-Spin has a question. Uh, you know, these questions are always interesting to me because because uh, um, I always think like you guys, when I answer these, you're probably thinking like, well, how would you answer this question, right? The question is, if I had to choose only one for the rest of my life, would I choose an electric or an acoustic? It'd be acoustic. Absolutely. Um, I don't know why the answer is that. I just, I really enjoy electric guitar immensely. But like I said, when I play acoustic, it's, I don't know. I also think at some point I'll end up just being mostly acoustic. You know, what I've learned is a lot of people, as they get older, they tend to play more acoustic, uh, even if they're not. So if you're acoustic, when you're younger, you're just acoustic. But even electric people, as they get older, they start to switch to electric, uh, acoustic. So I kind of like find myself as I get older, same thing. I like the acoustic even more. So. Uh, Okay, Voodoo Guitar says there's a lot of YouTube videos. Oh no. Saying there's a problem with ER guitars, bottom strings slipping off the fretboard and getting caught under the edge of the rounded frets. Anyone have this problem? So interesting enough, uh, I have, I don't know how many ER guitars I have reviewed. I want to say two or three. So two or three. That sounds about right. I have purchased two or three, <laughs> like three. Uh, Ralph has purchased one and another friend purchased two. And so I've had about eight, you know, whatever, 10, you know, not, not quite a dozen of guitars in my hand. So again, not proof of anything. And none of them had any issues when it came to that funny thing though, I will tell you this, that is absolutely possible. That's one of the downfalls of rounding over the frets like that. So when they round the frets over and drop them in, like the way Yard is doing and other manufacturers are doing, there's two things that are potentially possible, a problem, right? Obviously they're not coming to the, the, the farthest point of the edge of the fretboard. And so when you're bending the string, it come over the edge, especially if the string spacing is, uh, you know, not, is not very narrow. It's, it's wide and it's just right on the edge. Um, that's a problem. It can happen. Rounding the frets does sometimes the string will catch underneath, especially if there's a little bit of gap there, there's a little fix for that. You can do that with a file, but that happens. So, um, so here's, what's interesting. The reason I'm going to tell you this answer, I have not seen those videos on YouTube. I haven't seen anybody. So I don't know specifically what videos you're talking about or who, what their, their, uh, issues were, but I can tell you that it is very possible that they would have those issues because that is a, a flaw in that design. It's not a design flaw. It's just the flaw in that design, right? That can happen, especially if the, if the employee is overzealous with the, how they're setting up their guitar and filing and stuff. 
That being said, though, I will say I have noticed another company, ironically, in China. So here's this thing that's happening. It's kind of really confusing. If you notice, I kind of took a break and I'm not doing any more of these Amazon guitar videos anymore. And it's because here's the story that keeps happening to the point where I'm actually, you know, it's made me paranoid about it. <laughs> OK, every single one of these companies have the same story. Um, they they reach out to you. They uh, say, we want to send you a guitar and they send you the guitar and you check it out. And most of them, by the way, what, one thing I like about a lot of these upstart companies that use Amazon is they ship the guitar from you straight from Amazon. So, you know, they didn't cherry pick you a guitar. All the Irk guitars I've ever had, whether I bought them or Irk sent them, came straight from Amazon. No one could touch them between Amazon and me. OK, and so unless they set up every perfectly guitar on Amazon, right? They had no way to corrupt the, the guitar that was getting to me. So that made me feel pretty good. I know I'm not messing with guitar straight from their, their department. But here's where it gets interesting. Um, every, and so you do the video and then, you know, the guitars, whatever, they do whatever they're gonna do. And then always they email, somebody emails me and goes, oh, I used to be with this company. We're not friends anymore. And now I have another company. And I'm like, oh, and we don't like that company. And they don't like us and whatever. And so I can name, seriously, it's getting, it's getting actually exhausting. There is at least a half a dozen companies that I have, I have worked with on this channel. That's six. That's a lot of different companies, six companies that now have split off into now there's 12 companies. So it's like the other company contacts you and goes, Oh, I was the person doing the quality for them. Or I was the person who owned the brand, but they own the, the factory or the, I'm the factory, but they own the brand. All this stuff keeps happening. When it happened once, it was weird. Happens. Second time was kind of like, that's ah, weird coincidence. Third, fourth, fifth time, it starts getting a little weird, right? So all this keeps happening. Now, here's what I noticed, though. <laughs> the company that breaks off either makes the exact same guitar the exact same way. So you're like, this is just weird. Okay. Or in this case, what happened with ER guitars is I noticed one of their competitors all of a sudden not saying, oh, we don't do it that way. And here are the flaws in it. So they were describing the flaws that you were saying, which are potentially they could happen. However, they were saying it was a like a design flaw. I'm like it's not a design flaw. Um, even even high end companies like Jackson USA has taken notice of what Earth's done. So other companies have taken notice of what they were doing at that price point. And <coughs> excuse me, apologize for not muting the mic. Um, and uh, it is a cool idea to have the the hemispherical frets on the ends and stuff. So again, it's not for everybody. Somebody's playing is different. Um, uh, I have a problem, so you know, with certain vintage style strats, I always yank the high E off the side of the fretboard just because how close they keep the edge and then the employees get overzealous with the rounding of the fretboard and it just gets a little too nuts for me. So it's possible. But like I said, it's funny to me. So my answer to your question is, I haven't heard that, but it is possible. But I also have seen companies directly who were somehow involved with that company directly marketing against that. <laughs> so interesting. So what I'm basically saying is I don't know if that was something somebody discovered as a problem with the air guitars or if somebody's reading the ad copy of their competing manufacturers and saying that's what's happening. It's probably a little both. It could be so. And that being said, I have nothing and in, I'm not involved with any of those companies. I don't uh, I, I don't even respond to any of those companies anymore. Um, as much as I like their guitars and promote it, I'm pointing at the wrong guitar. The ER guitars and stuff are really cool. Um, and obviously, I just talked about the ER guitar. You got to understand, I haven't talked to anybody from ER in like at least a year, maybe a year, two years. So, so like I said, I just think they make... Um, and by the way, they were actually who I was talking about the other day. I said I, I, I recommended a guitar to somebody that was like 200, two, 300 bucks, and it was like six now. And I was like, oh. And they go, okay. And I go, oh, not for six. <laughs> I go, for six. And I recommend another brand. So, so. Um, T Spin wants to know what's the worst guitar I've ever used? And I mean, I, you know, obviously all the worst guitars I've ever done or worked on or been around or played are all going to be entry level student grade instruments, you know, with horrible fret work. And, um, it would only be insightful if I could say like there's a high end brand or a mid tier brand that I just thought was horrible or had horrible quality. And, you know, again, uh, I don't know, nothing sticks out for me. Um, I would say, 
Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything. I mean, I've done some videos where I've, you know, also critique companies to the point where the, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, it killed their sales for months and even they don't stick out as really, really being, you know, horrible, horrible. They're just wearing up to snuff in certain areas, but yeah, I don't know. Um, let's see. All right, hold on a second. I don't understand the question. Uh, I don't know how to say the name. Abba something. <laughs> Abba I owe it something fail. Says experts should blindfold guitar tests. You know, it's funny blindfold guitar tests. I've never done any blindfold guitar tests uh, as a video. Okay. Um, but here's what I can tell you. Uh, that's why I don't <laughs> do it on a video. So interesting. I've said that on a video. Um, so, um, I have blindfolded myself or we've blindfolded me, like, especially at the shop for years, guys would, you know, we, we do try things, you know, same thing, you know, blindfold because the Anderton's guys were doing it. We're like, that's really cool. Let's try it. And my experience doing it was I could pick the right thing every time. Um, there's a difference between guitar players and guitar repair person. Remember, I'm not a guitar player. I'm a guitar repair. The, the, the history of my, where I come from, the background, which is why my deep dive series, why my videos are like, let's measure this. Let's check this stuff. It's in, you know, or here's a tip, tip on how I would fix that. Uh, you know, I, I get it. Some people put messages in the videos like, man, get to playing this thing. Stop talking about it. I'm like, yeah, but that's really where my, that's where my experience comes from. I, I mean, you're not going to watch me. No one's going to watch and go, oh, he's been, he's played guitar in local bands. You know, let's watch him play guitar. It's no, he's fixed guitars for years. What does he see when he sees this? That's the, essentially what you want, right? You want, um, to me, when I see Tim Pierce talk about a guitar, I want to see a veteran studio musician look at an instrument and tell me what a veteran studio musician sees when seeing this that I can't see, hear, detect, or feel. When I look at a guitar, you're not going to get like, oh man, I, this makes me shred faster than ever before. That's not what I, I don't, I don't really talk that way. What I talk about is here are the things I think are going to be half, you're going to have to fix in a couple years. Here are the things you shouldn't worry about, right? Cause no matter what, you know, no matter what this, this isn't likely to break. Um, here are some things that they did to cost, you know, co uh, save some money on costs that kind of suck for the price point. Here are some things that they gave you that are valuable. Um, it's more of just, an, you know, like I said, almost like asking a, me a mechanic to take a look at a car and go, what do you, what do you see, uh, you know, as a potential problem in the future or what, where do you see what they did and why do they make some of these decisions? And that's what I hope I can impart. And again, just because I've been doing it, anybody could do that. It's just, you got to create a channel and do it. Now, the reason I point that out is because on a blindfold test, um, I've seen them do it. And if you gave, if you gave a guitar player, a made, <laughs> a made Mexico Strat, this is going to be crazy, but it's true. If you gave a Mexico Strat, an American Strat, and you go play these two and tell me what's different. And they're going to go, Oh, you know, maybe one will detect it. Maybe one won't detect the difference. Me, the first thing I'm going to do is smell it. And that's the first thing I did when we did the taste, the taste test, the blind test. I started smelling the things. I can smell the difference between polyurethane versus, versus lacquer. I can smell the difference between cellophane finish and polyurethane. Um, and it's not because I'm a Finnish person. It's because, again, you're working on guitars. You sand. I sand guitars. I know what the smell of poly smells like once you start sanding it. I know what um, somebody, I told you guys, somebody asked me a, a horrible question question that I had to admit to, which was somebody asked me on the videos, I said, Oh, this is, they say this is a bone nut and I've confirmed that. And then I go on. And then when you guys asked me, how did you know it was a bone nut? And I said the truth, which is I bit it. Um, because when my teeth touch bone versus plastic, even if it's even man-made tusk materials that are like, I can just, I can feel the difference in my teeth from doing it for years, you know? Um, <laughs> I used to watch like repair. If you do, if you're a repair person for a living, you know, there's certain things you can just solve with a taste or touch, you know, right. Um, <laughs> it's just how it is. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if you took the average person and had them, 
you know, uh, dip their finger in, 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 you know, lighter fluid and then gasoline and they could tell a difference. But a mechanic probably could, right? Or somebody who's around it all the time. So same thing with this. Uh, so the blindfold tests for me are, were a little interesting when we did them. And and here's what's interesting about that. Um, you can go, well, that would be interesting. It wouldn't be interesting because it's not something I can impart knowledge about because I'd be like, hey, if you worked on a thousand instruments, you would start feeling things too that are different. Um, interesting enough. Uh I mean, you can kind of feel the difference in how they chrome plate stuff. Like I said, if you have to fix things, you start noticing the differences in a different way because it's a those those things look like problems to you. <laughs> they look like problems to me. <laughs> that's why I'm looking at stuff. Sometimes I don't look at things as like, that's cool. I look at it like, I don't want to work on that. It's going to suck or that's a problem or that's going to take me longer. So, um, so there you go. Uh, Joe says, Jeffrey Dahmer did the same thing. Interesting. Um, yeah, like I said, trust me, I wasn't proud to say that, but it is an interesting way to do it, and it works. Um, Dave says, bone nuts smell uh, weird when you sand them. They smell exactly like uh, the same. A bone nut, if you sand on it as many times as as I have sanded on it, um, it is horrible when you go to the dentist and get your teeth worked on because to me it smells like the same thing as when I smell, you know, uh, if you ever had your teeth drilled on, that's what it smells like when you sand on a bone nut on a guitar. If you haven't experienced that. This is why, like I said, it's not that subtle, is it? <laughs> right? Some of you guys are like, how do you know? Look, if you ever sanded on any bone material for an instrument, you'll know the smell. It smells exactly if you've ever had the misfortune to have your teeth drilled on by a dentist, it's got the same exact smell. It smells the same. So, like burnt bone, burnt flesh kind of thing. I don't know. Um, okay, um, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's see if I have any more question, early wire questions that I missed. I grabbed a bunch. Uh, this one was a good one. This one came from Southpaw007007. says, does the ground metal on the plate on a Telecaster bridge matter? It does. Um, or is it just always steel? Um, well, it's going to be steel, usually copper plated, but it's steel. Or it's going to be uh, plastic or a bobbin. So uh, I don't know why I say a bobbin. Uh, it's going to be some kind of board or plastic right? Um, the most important thing is it's either going to be steel or it's just going to be a non-metal material. And the reason is, is because the way a, um, a way a Telecaster pickup works is, is the screws go, um, through the bridge into this steel plate. And essentially the, um, the ground wire touches all that and then it increases. And then the, the magnets that are touching the plate. So this is the important part. The slugs in the magnet are touching the bottom plate. The screws that are holding the pickup in place are touching the bottom plate. They're also touching the bridge. The magnetic field is then uh, increased. I don't know if increased is the right word, but it's essentially changed. That's actually a better word. Changed by the plate at the bottom and then touching the bridge, it all becomes essentially um, a different magnetic field added to it, an additional field. So you have to um, the way my wife liked the way I explained, sometimes I was explaining pickups to her one time and I said, I liked, I liked explaining this this way. I wish I had a pickup here. I usually do is that when you think of six individual slugs and a single coil pickup, this is what I want you to think about. Um, what I want you to picture in your head. And again, this is not hundred percent accurate, but it will illustrate to the point where it gets you pretty damn close. If you think of six individual slugs in a single coil pickup where each slug is a magnet, I want you to think of the magnetic field like a flame, like if you had a lighter, right? Got a little lighter or a candle, think of that flame, the shape. I want you to picture that shape as a magnetic field over each slug. Again, we're, we're going for close enough to still illustrate without any kind of like graphs and charts. Okay. So that's what the pickup, that's what the magnetic field looks like. Okay. Um, if you were to take six steel slugs and put a bar magnet on the bottom, 
you would still get those same magnetic fields coming off the slug, but then you would get a, another magnetic field, like an oval almost, caused by that bar magnet. See how that works differently? Okay. So there's two essentially magnetic fields, and then, of course, the bar magnet one's going to be the softer field. So this, think of the Telecaster pickup the same way. You have the six slugs. I don't know why I'm holding four fingers to that. <laughs> six slugs, six individual flames, right? Okay, those individual magnetic fields. And then uh, another softer magnetic field being caused by that plate and the bridge. And that is a part of the sound of the Telecaster. And you can stop that by using a plastic base or a fiberboard base instead of a steel plate. And, uh, and some players like that. By the way, the GE Smith has a Telecaster, signature Telecaster, where they use a bridge where it, it doesn't go to the pickup and it isolates it from that reason. I don't know if that's why he chose to do it. Some players have said that when they change that magnetic field, it does absolutely nothing to the sound. And some players say it's imperative to the sound. Uh, I'm not arguing either side. I could give two rat's asses about either one, <laughs> right? I, there's nothing specifically in anything in me that says I have to make it a certain way or I have to have a traditional or non-traditional way. Um, you know, if the guitar sounds good, it sounds good. I just look at like, hey, it sounds good. What made it sound good? And then I look at the components and that's the component layout. As you, as you guys know, I like I like sharing all this stuff on the channel, you know, the videos with stuff. But keep in mind, a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, I want to I want to know like you guys what it does. But at the end of it, I don't know if it's something that I would actually pay time or money or effort into if it if it wasn't just already there. The uh, Chris Goodwin, thanks, man. He says, I'm always surprised that we don't have a thousand. We have a thousand views consistently, but we don't have a thousand likes. Look, you know what? Some people don't like to do likes. I get it. Um, so, uh, some people don't like looks cause, likes because it puts it in their like history and all that stuff. You don't have to give likes. The um, the interesting thing about this podcast show that is really cool and I really appreciate. Let me just tell you what I appreciate um, more than anything else. Um, the uh, the these long shows that I do, the most impressive stat that I get is how long people watch and listen to it. It's really interesting and long, and that's what I appreciate the most, more so than anything else. The fact that all of you, the fact that you guys hang out to the end. I mean, there's almost still a thousand of you guys hanging out to the end. I appreciate that more so than the likes. That's just awesome. It's, you know, it makes me feel like, I don't know, you guys like hanging out. <laughs> okay, let's do this last. We got a last super chat came in. Let me hit this. And then we will start our weekends. Uh, I don't know how to where in the B. <laughs> why, why, way near B. Ah, man. All right. Uh, if I can't get your name, at least I'll get your question. He says, hey, Phil, what would be your take on good mid-price short scale bass? Play guitar, but I like something not huge. Like to lay down some decent hard rock bass tracks. I, you know what? There's a ton of short scale basses that I love. Let me look if you don't mind, uh, because um, in this world you have to double check what you suggest because stuff just doesn't exist anymore, right? So what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at four string short scale instruments that are available for sale. Do they have? Do they do it by scale? Probably not. Oh, they do. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Do that. Hold on a second. So uh, let's me do multiples. Good, right? So I'm going to do 32 inch scale, which is a medium scale. So that's not technically a short scale. It's medium scale. It's what I mostly play. So, you know, it's 32 inch scale, but like my Kiesel is a 30 inch scale. I'm going to grab the 30 inch scales. Does it not let me do multiple scale? Oh, it does. Okay. I got a bunch. Oh, it only lets me pick so many. How cool is that? And when I cool by cool, I mean, how not cool is that? This is going to take a second. It's like I messed up by hitting the 32 inch scales. Okay, so what I want is 30 and 32. So that's what we're going to look at. Okay, if you don't mind. All right, here we go. Let's... uh. Let's sort out and see what we can see. Okay, so we're looking at Sweetwater. We're looking at what they have in stock. So first uh, thing I see is the Fender Special Edition Mustang P-Bass. I've played those. They are pretty cool. Um, I would say, but 850 bucks is not in the affordable range. Let's go ahead and sort 
by low to high price. Let's see what's in there. Let's see what comes up. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Squire Bronco bases. Um, I have played them. They're great. Uh, I don't know why I said they're great. They're good. They're good. That's it. Here's one of the ones I like, uh, the Tallman uh, TB, TMB30 base right here in mint green. This one is one of my faves out right here. Any of these three colors, green, black, $229. I I, I have actually played this base many times. I, I've owned one for a while before I got my little custom one because I don't have a custom base, you know, right? But I can tell you right now, like quality wise, you know, at that price, $229, you might have, you know, as you've seen my videos, you might have a couple issues you might have to deal with when you get it. But, you know, at 229 it might be worth it. Um, I have not tried the Squire Affinity Series Jaguar, but that looks pretty cool, especially with that Music Man style pickup right there. The Ibanez Mezo, Mezo base, which I thought that was called Micro with a K. Huh, so now it's called Mezo, but I thought it was Micro with a K. These are really cool. Um, I like these two. These are going to be a little shorter on scale than those fenders, and they're going to feel a little bit more travel you know small condensed right so it's if you want something even smaller you're you're basically saying you're a guitar player and you just want a bass that's easier to play i i would say that for me i would definitely look at that first i would definitely look at the ibanez tallman bass that one for sure um even though i'm pretty sure that's the 32 inch scale let's double check that as i'm looking Oh, it's 30 inch, even better. Okay, perfect, 30 inch. That's where you wanna be. It's gonna be easy to play. Let's go back and let's see if anything pokes out. Oh, the Squire Classic Vibe with the split pickup. That's pretty cool, 429. I have not tried these Paranormal ones, but these look cool, but I haven't tried them, so I don't know. Um, So based on what I see here, Without looking at used stuff and everything else on the market, I would definitely say the Tolman. So the base that I liked even more was Squire had one that was like a Jaguar hybrid, like what I showed you. Um, and it was really cool, but it, obviously they don't make it anymore. So you'd have to look online. But those are ones I like for sure. So that, that I hope that makes um, Lee says, uh, Sire SS Marcus Miller base love, love mine. I think the problem with those again is price, right? He's trying to say, I I'm again, everybody's got different opinions on mid. Well, he said mid priced. So I guess it's what your argument is mid priced is. So I guess, yeah, if you're mid priced, you're five, $600, 700 bucks, 600 bucks. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Oh, here you go. Let's go. Great. Great suggestion. I have not tried this, and again, so I haven't tried it. So, I don't, but 434 bucks for this Marcus Marcus Miller U5 Alder body. That looks pretty cool. Let's see what the scale on that is. Is that 32 or 30? It is 30. Yeah, that looks pretty cool. And as you guys know, I'm a huge Sire fan. Really cool stuff. I bought some Sires. I did a, a videos on them. Really cool. And um, they sent some Sires too, as well. But uh, but I bought oh, the first two Sires. I think I did videos and I bought, and then they sent one because they like those videos. So yeah, those are some suggestions. I hope that kind of helps. Um, let's see. Okay. And I think we did it. Did we do it? We did it. <laughs> we made it to the end. It's the end of the show. All right. And I still can't find this correct screen. <laughs> so as you guys know, as the show goes, I just pull up all these screens and after a while, like I, cause I'm not closing them. It just it gets a nightmarish at the end. All right. Um, so on that note, I think we're going to call it. Uh, if you guys didn't hear, uh, please feel free to enter to win the Paul Ritz Smith Swamp Ash, uh, uh, special it's a really cool guitar and like i said it's uh, all you have to do is just basically sign up no one will contact you through social media i'm not going to contact you and, be like, and no one's going to ask you for any money or anything like i said it's just ask for your email i'm the one that emails you it's pmcknight7 at gmail.com you'll respond to me 
if you're concerned about it, like I said, I have no problem supplying a cell phone number and you can call me real quick and I'd be like, hi, I'm only going to talk to you for a few minutes. Cause, and then I'll go be like, yeah, you won. Have a nice day. <laughs> and then, uh, and th so there you go. So, so, uh, you know, just keep in mind, cause I don't want anybody confused. If anyone's trying to scam anybody out there, there's nobody should be asking you for anything or talking to you in any platform other than direct email to me. And, uh, that's why we send you straight to the www.knowyourgearpodcast.com website. We send you there. And then from there, it takes you to King Sumo, which is a third party site that does the random drawing for us. So it's really cool. So, um, uh, so I hope, I hope you guys had fun with that. Uh, thank you again for everybody who signed up for the snarks and we'll do snarks again next week. Thank you everybody who uh, signed up to win the uh, Squire and um, we'll keep doing that. I think the next giveaway, I don't know if I should tell you, but I think the next giveaway we're working on, not for sure. I think we're going to do a Dane Electro uh, three pickup. It's like a $750 guitar. Um, the giveaway is pretty cool. I hope you guys enjoy them. We're going to do some, oh, we have a cool amp coming. Um, um, this is, a uh, again, kind of like with my wife helping now some, uh, some of the things she's done to improve the channel besides a ton of other things. Um, she's like, when we talk to companies like, Hey, can we do a giveaway? Can we do a giveaway? Can we do a giveaway? And, um, it's really cool. And, um, uh, it just, uh, it's really cool, right? It's, uh, it's really nice. I learned, uh, <laughs> I learned, um, from her that, that's something that most companies will say yes to is, hey, yeah, yeah, we'll give you some products to give away. And we're like, well, well might as well. Might as well get some out of the deal uh, for you guys, right? All right. And on that note, I'm going to thank you guys for your time. Till next Friday. Oh, okay. Okay. It's a secret. i going to tell you a secret. <laughs> I'm waiting. It's only 950 people left. So I'm waiting for 943. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, here's a secret uh, for those that hang out to the end. Next week, if you go on Kiesel's uh, Facebook page next Thursday, and they do a live QA every Thursday on Kiesel's Facebook page um, at their factory, you might see a familiar face. <laughs> so, um, and I'm just saying that because uh, Kiesel already said that I was going to be there next week. So obviously they let it on their bag on their side. So yes. So if you go to Kiesel's Facebook page for next Wednesday, um, you can, uh, you might see my face there inside the factory. What's cool is if you want to leave a question that you want to ask about that, you can send that to the ask, or sorry, to know your gear podcast.com. You can go to the ask thing and send in a question and pre, so I have it when I get there at the factory, anything you want to know about Kiesel guitars or anything. And also you put it on this video too. I will search uh, the comments and questions here. And if it's uh, you know, interesting comment question, we'll, we'll bring it up with, uh, the guys at Kiesel, but I will be there next week and I'll be there, uh, uh, Thursday for the QA, but don't worry. I'll still be here Friday for next week's show. It's just, you know, it's not that far for me. So we're going to do something special there. And, uh, and, uh, I'm excited about it. It's going to be crazy, crazy. So, all right. On that note, now I'll let you guys go. All right, guys. See you next Friday. Thanks for your time.